I don't know how many people were here. I think it was September or so when I uh, last spoke, but I appreciate your inviting me back. That was the first time I'd ever spoken before I'd been asked to do so. And I thought it must have been a very a reasonably successful time. But Mark assured me that with the holidays, I'm just the only one he could get. So, uh, this is the way it is. You know, I, I, as Mark said, I've flown for 37 years, and as a result, like all of us in here, I have a lot of stories that I can tell and I can share. And the last time was, and there are always the, uh, the crowd pleasers like the elephant story and the one later this evening. And uh, instead of just telling the story, I wanted to try to maybe have some kind of a point. There's no major insights here, but I wanted to at least offer some incidents from my life, my experiences, and things that I learned that I did wrong and things I did right that might help somebody at some point in time when they're flying. So, uh, again, we've covered the C-130s, uh, EP-3s, uh, then 737s, Airbuses, and a variety of other aircraft for American, 777s, 72s, 73s, etc. And the first story I wanted to get into to try to bring some kind of cohesiveness to talking about those stories was uh, next one here, Mark, if you would. Okay, how, to, how and when to think versus act. Um, this is something that I've noticed over the years for myself and the years of doing that job, that depending on the situation, sometimes it was better to do one thing versus the other. Sometimes it was important to think first and then act. Sometimes it was important to act first and then think. And all of them, the end result, led to hangar flying, as I hope and I'm sure everybody here does, to try to review the things that were done correctly, mistakes, and if not even mistakes, just how things could be done better and more smoothly. So um, look at some examples here. The first one that I wanted to mention was we're flying one day, it was in a Super 80, so we're at 33,000 feet, and we're basically coming right up over the top of Atlanta. We get a couple of chimes in the back, and the flight attendants tell me that there's a woman in the back, she stopped breathing, heart stopped, she's turning blue and all that. So they activated all their procedures in the back, and we started with our procedures up front. And this did not go nearly as smoothly as I would have liked for it to in hindsight, but I did learn a lot from this. So we all know that there are, you know, you get an engine failure, there's prescribed things to do. You have a sick passenger, there are things that we have to do to get everyone on the ground. And of course, like everyone in this business, we all deal with people's lives all the time. So you kind of get used to that, but it's a little bit different when it's somebody who is acutely having their life threatened with the situation going on. And what happened at that stage is adrenaline kicked in. So we're right over Atlanta, and part of the other problem with this, I was a relatively new captain. I had never been through a medical emergency. I had never flown with this first officer before, so he's kind of an unknown quantity at that point, and he had never been through a medical emergency before either. So we're just basically figuring this out as we went. First thing we did after I got that is I told him, call the ATC, tell him we want to go to Atlanta, declare a medical emergency, an emergency, and run through that whole routine with them. They accomplished that, or he accomplished that, and it was my leg, and I started the descent. Well, the first problem was we were basically right on top of Atlanta. So they cleared us, okay, 33,000 feet, you're cleared down to 3,000 feet to for the outer uh, final approach fix for this approach. Here's the weather, go for it. Well, we were too close. We didn't have time to get down, and I should have anticipated that, but I did not see that. So it turned into a huge rush. Instead of doing a nice spiraling descent that would have kept us in the area and had it nice and smooth, went in too straight, too hot, coming into Atlanta, and I'll never forget this, it was a nice day there. So they cleared everybody out of our path. We're coming in, and all the Delta airplanes are lined up there. And here comes this crazy American Airlines airplane, flying too fast, trying to get down. It's not looking good. And I can picture all these people in Delta sitting there looking at this, looking at me and thinking, oh God, I hope he doesn't crash and close the wrong because it probably looked like we were about to. So we came screaming in, 
couldn't make it. The first officer was helping me out. I knew it probably wasn't going to happen, but like all of this, you take it to the limit of your abilities before you correct things if you're trying to get something accomplished. So it got to the point where it was obvious it wasn't going to work. We did a go around, had to come back and land again. At that point, that wasn't exactly helping my anxiety or adrenaline level because now I'm thinking with everything else that's going on, this person in the back, God forbid they died during this go around because I didn't accomplish the arrival correctly. Well, in hindsight, the go around probably didn't take any longer than if we had done the descent more in a more controlled fashion. So it really didn't matter, but still didn't feel good about doing that at the time. We did the go around, came back and landed, coming into the gate, Super 80s are notoriously light in the nose. It has to do with the high sweep on the wing, the CG that you uh, get as a result of that. So when they're light on fuel, the nose skitters around a lot. So in addition to the Delta guys looking at me, hoping I wasn't going to close the airport, as we're coming into the gate, I was coming in a little fast for that again, and the whole airplane kind of starts skidding sideways a little bit, and I just saw the whole, all the ground off and go <laughs> so we got a kick out of that once we got to the gate. So uh, that was the first incident that I wanted to at least mention tonight. So the idea there is, and I, I think it might have been on the previous slide, if you can go back, was to wind your clock. Now, I don't know how many people have seen a clock like that. If you have, you've been around aviation for quite a while like I have. But that's the old military eight-day clock. And the other thing that goes along with a clock like that is when something goes wrong, first thing you do is wind your clock. You stop, you pause for a minute, you don't do anything crazy like immediately start sending to an airport directly below you. Think about what you're trying to do, and then after it's wound and you've had a chance to calm down a little and let the adrenaline ease off, do what you have to do. That is a phrase that comes from back in uh, the Right Stuff days. It was in that book, and apparently it was the technique that the test pilots back in the 50s used when they found themselves in extreme situations also. So the thing is to avoid rushing, like I did, wind the clock, relax for a second, think about what you need to do, and use your resources. I wasn't as good at using my first officer as a resource at that time, again, first time doing this, and secondly, because I didn't know this man, as I've mentioned. Obviously, to be sitting up there in the cockpit with me, certain levels of qualification had to be met. But since none of us had done this before, I didn't really know where he would be in terms of being able to assist me, and I did not give him enough to do and took too much on myself, so that was a mistake also. So. Avoid rushing to judgment, wind your clock, use your resources, and uh, and go back in the back and play guitar if all those things. <laughs> so that was the first one about don't act, think. Don't be in such a hurry to do something that you haven't considered what you really need to do and how to do it most effectively. But then for the second example that I uh, wanted to offer, uh, don't think act. Now, for the I don't, uh, show of hands, if I may, for who was here with my last talk, because I don't want to belabor the point too much with this one. This is a repeat uh, story, as it were, but it illustrates the exact opposite of the first story because in this one it was a requirement to act immediately without thinking, just using the reflex action that we are taught in the simulators by the company. And it was just for a quick refresher, and for those who might not have heard it, we were descending out of Austin or into Austin, saw an aircraft taking off, climbing up towards us, closing in on our screen, say we're about here. We could see him coming like this. The uh, level of warning from the TCAS system kept getting higher and higher. It eventually gave us a resolution advisory where the computer told us to descend as it was as the other aircraft was climbing that got our attention but the rules are if you can't see the other aircraft yourself do what the computer tells you we did that the computer realized it was making a mistake and gave us a climb climb now and it actually does get louder when it gives the reversals like that climb climb now and it keeps giving you the instruction until you get into the safe zone 
of the flight regimen. And when you do this, the reason you don't think and you just act, with the initial TCAS alert, you have five seconds to respond. That's what the system is predicated upon. But when you get a reversal, you have two and a half seconds to respond. And that starts getting real short because when it gave us the reversal, gives us a descent, then tells us to start climbing, it was the first officer's leg in this case, the first thing he did was look at me like, what? Because this is something you see in the training, in the simulators, on our computers, but you don't see it in reality or you never expect to. So the startle effect takes a moment to get over. I said, yes, you know, execute the escape maneuver and go ahead and start climbing. Turned into full military power, full back stiff, climbing as fast as we could, et cetera. But the contrast of this particular incident with the first one is sometimes you need to think first before you do things, and sometimes you just need to do things. And it's kind of having that in your mind is what I felt or found to be the case before you get into the situation is advisable. And you always have to be flexible, as we all know in this business also. Then the last uh, example is one that, um, this, is, this is the other one that people like to hear me tell. Uh, so it's, it's a kind of a fun story in a lot of ways. So uh, Team Spirit 1989. Team Spirit is a large military operation that occurs most every year between the South Koreans, the American forces, the Australians, Thais, etc. All the people who would be defending South Korea from North Korea in the case of aggression. And it's a, uh, it's an exercise designed to make it clear to the North Koreans it would not be in their best interest to go ahead and invade the South. So this is a large multinational, uh, multi, you know, million, hundreds of millions of dollars to set this up and to execute it. So, <clears throat> oh, um, I'll get back to I hope I don't forget that. Um, we are flying, we flew 24 hour coverage. We are in an EP3, which is the uh, surveillance, electronic surveillance or spying aircraft that uh, the Navy used to keep an eye on things and just watch the entire operation as it was going on. And we would fly, when we flew those airplanes, we had very specific rules that we had to follow. And that was both for our safety and for the sake of the other people that we were flying around. So everyone had an idea when we, what we were going to do and where we were going to do it. Keeps all the tensions down, keeps all the surprises down, so nobody gets carried away or, uh, or acts without thinking first, to go back to the previous uh, example. So we're out flying around and uh, we're collecting information on station, as it were, and there is an inbound threat detected. And uh, the inbound threat was a North Korean MiG-21 that was uh, coming after us, coming out to say hello, as it were. And uh, let me see, I, was, I wrote down. <clears throat> Sources indicated that there was an aggressive flight profile with a high confidence of a real threat coming our way. That's the uh, discreet way I can kind of mention what they were talking about doing. North Koreans were coming out to say hello to us. They were not happy with where we were and what we were doing. Now, this particular team spirit exercise, as I said, has gone on for years and years. It did not happen this year because it, every year generates a lot of political tension. And the president this year decided it was best not to do that to avoid the political tension. He was trying to accomplish other goals, of course. Good, bad, and different. You know, he was doing what he thought was correct. So this particular year, when we were making it clear to the North Koreans that it was not a good idea to try to invade the South, they decided apparently that they wanted to um, make their own point towards us. So as they came out towards us, uh, we had very specific <coughs> guidelines that we had to follow and things we had to do and triggers that would make us need to do those. And the initial trigger is to turn around and exit the area. Just vacate, get out of the way, make it clear that we're not there to cause trouble. And as we detect trouble, we want to leave and not escalate things. That was not sufficient to solve the situation. 
uh, after that it became not just leave, but leave as quickly as possible. We ended up going with firewalling the power on the aircraft and uh, trying to exit as quickly as we could. We were informed by the, and it was on the previous slide, the AWACS that that was not working quite sufficiently yet. So our next move at that point, because it was a nice clear day, uh, there were no clouds to go hide in. The next thing we had to do was to send down to the sea surface as uh, quickly as we could. So after trying to get out with power, we went to idle power so we could get down and uh, descend as quickly as possible. We went from 27,500 feet down to 75 feet off the water. We exceeded VNE for our velocity not to exceed on the aircraft. Uh, we had HF antennas that would run from the vertical stabilizer towards the nose of the aircraft because you needed the long antenna for those frequencies. They were beating against the side of the plane. They'd come, they were loose and uh, they didn't hold up to the airspeed we were with or what we were using. We got down to the uh, water and fortunately for us that day, it was a MiG-21 that was coming after us because they also had more current aircraft and if they had had one of those coming after us, uh, I probably very likely would not be standing here right now. We were lucky in that they ran, they got to the end of their fuel state and had to depart and go back to their home base, which allowed us to take on the next set of problems that came up. Next set of problems. This incident occurred, it was on my, it was crazy, it was on my last mission with this squadron. We were going to finish this mission, I was going to finish this mission, get up the next morning, get on an airplane, because we were based out of Japan for this exercise, I was going to go back to Guam where our, our unit was stationed and I was going to start my permanent transfer out to my next duty station. And not only was it my last mission for this particular unit, it was also the last leg of the last mission. We were turning around, about to turn around when we started and head back when everything started falling apart. The key behind that is not just the uh, almost got you know got out of there without having to deal with this notion but after a 12-hour mission our fuel state's very low so now we've just firewalled the engines we've dropped the turbine engines down to the sea surface where fuel consumption has shot up you know three four fold whatever it was on that and now we have to worry about where what are we going to do fuel wise weather was scheduled to be a little bit iffy back at our base we checked that it was still a little bit dodgy Fuel initially did not look like we were going to be able to get back to our home base, and we started planning to land at a commercial Japanese airport with a whole variety of classified and a variety of very high levels of classified information on board after an international incident that shut down a multi-hundred million dollar military operation, and people were not very pleased about that. They wanted us back, they wanted us back on a Navy base that they controlled, but safety had to come first because if we ran out of fuel or got back there and the weather was not such that we had enough fuel, that causes all sorts of other problems as everybody here knows, of course. So once we realized that we were going to be safe and we were going to be able to have the option of getting back somewhere, we zoom climbed up as high as we could get to back up to the 27,500 feet. We might have even made it to 28,000 feet where it was so light at that point. We reevaluated the weather, looked at our options. We decided we could make it back to our base in Atsugi, Japan, made it back there. Um, needless to say, there was quite a reception waiting for us, a welcoming committee of all sorts of people wanting all kinds of information from us, uh, myself and the other I was the aircraft and mission commander, and we had a few other people in the back who ran other aspects of the mission. We were all hustled immediately into the, uh, into the secure spaces where we could tell them what had happened and why. And I'm pleased to say that after it was all said and done, and our messages explaining why we had done what we did went up the chain of command, everybody up the chain of command and back down approved of what we had done. They thought it was a uh, the prudent thing to do. So that was nice because otherwise that's a career ending escapade. So um, the, uh, well, yeah, and when it was all over with, 
the navigator, Lieutenant John Brubaker, on board the aircraft. His wife was pregnant at the time. He was so grateful to be on the ground in one piece, they named their son after me, which is the nicest compliment that one could ever hope for in life, of course. And the idea with this particular story goes back to the think and act sort of concept. And with this one, think then act continued. The thinking was started months and months earlier, if not almost two years earlier, as I started getting trained for this particular type of mission. Started learning what the parameters were, what our restrictions were and weren't, what we needed to do, what we couldn't do, when we had to do what, and for different parts of the world, we had different things we had to do. So we had to learn all that, and that's the beginning of the hangar flying. And as those of us who showed up at the squadron at the same time went through this program and learned these things and worked our way up in that hierarchy, we all talked about, well, what if this happens? What if that happens? What are you going to do? You're going to do this? You're going to do that? And we all had a chance to sort through the proper solution. Of course, the end is, at the end result is, the mission commander, aircraft commander makes the call. But having sorted through the options and the thoughts with other people, with my peers, it helped make the decision easier to make at the time. And in addition, with having learned all the rules of the road, as it were, for this particular type of flying, that also was the thinking before acting. So that as things occurred during this particular mission, you've already foreseen not this exact scenario, but the potential for it anyway and have thought through both through knowing the rules, knowing your aircraft, and through speaking with your peers, what you would choose to do as the safest course of action. Of course, the primary concern is the uh, military asset and then the crew after that. This particular aircraft, um, you may recall after uh, George W. Bush, the second Bush was elected president, Shortly after he was elected, in the springtime of his first year after his inauguration, there was a Russian fighter that ran into one of our Navy spy planes, and that was one of these particular spy planes. Uh, this individual landed at Hainan Island, big diplomatic to do back and forth, and they eventually got the crew back, and in pieces they got the aircraft back also. But those are basically the, I, the things that I wanted to share some stories that Mark had asked me to share, but try to put it in a little bit different context than just telling stories like I did last time. I didn't expect to be asked back, to be honest with you. Um, and one note, the thing I wanted to remember to mention that I paused about just a few minutes ago, the uh, passenger, the sick passenger that we had to deal with, the medical emergency. As I said, that was the first time I'd flown with that particular first officer, and the first time either one of us had dealt with a medical emergency. The second time I flew with that first officer, we had another medical emergency. <laughs> so we were two for two at that point. But the third time we flew together, we flew three days together and everything went great. <laughs> so nobody tried to die and uh, of course we didn't try to kill anybody. So if you have any questions, please feel free. Um, but those are the stories I wanted to share and a little bit more beyond just the story themselves. Mark, just to add to your uh, story about the MiG-21, you guys might want to know that the reason that the MiG-21 fell so short was it could accelerate to Mach 2.2, but only carry 537 gallons of fuel in the bladder tanks in the fuselage. So at 1,000 pounds an hour burn, the airplane could only stay in the air for about 35 minutes total from the time it took off, even with a supersonic drop tank to get it off the ground. So it had about a 10 minute run out, a couple minutes on target, a 10 minute back, and then it landed with no gas. And that's how they ran those things. And we used to have one here, my brother and I had one, but they carried basically no gas. So they, <laughs> cause of that, you escape because they- Thank goodness for that. They Absolutely. I was not aware of that. Yeah. yeah, that was amazing. And I didn't know a whole lot about them, but uh, General Dave McLeod used to be a good friend of mine. He was a three star and he was really big into the Russian airplanes. And when he used to, before he passed away, he used to come up here and be put, you know, CAF air shows, and he told me a number of times, he said, Steve, he said, your MiG-21, just like it says, can do 2.2. He said, but if we want to get our plane to its maximum, 
that we have to take that thing and buff it down to its absolute perfect, everything's perfect about it, except that that Russian airplane, as bad as it's put together, it'll do it, because it's all motor. Mm -hmm. It's all engine, it's a rocket. The other interesting thing that the Russians did when they constructed their fighters is they were smart enough and economical enough that they knew where they had to perfect the fuselage and where they didn't. So in the areas where they had airflow that they needed to maintain the laminar airflow, they would have the rivets flush. In the areas where that wasn't a concern, such as uh, when the fuselage, you know, it starts out in a certain width, tapers oftentimes because you have the wings and the wings offset it for the, uh, for the cross section of the aircraft and then it widens out again. Well, in the slightly narrower portion of the fuselage, there's no laminar airflow there, there's no lifting surface, the rivets would stick out because they didn't need them not to. Made manufacturing quicker, made it less expensive, and that was uh, one of the many tricks that they used. They also used uh, tube, uh, tube technology when we had already gone to solid state. The reason they stuck with tube technology, it wasn't subject to EMP, electromagnetic pulse, in a nuclear war. You could see what they were planning for. Any other questions, thoughts, anything I can? Your first, your first example, um, mm -hmm. that was uh, daytime? It was daytime. Sense? Daytime VFR, it was nice weather. Uh, there was, yeah, it was, it was as good as you could ask for it to be in terms of the circumstances. And uh, having done it before with this gentleman and done it once before myself, the second medical emergency we had, piece of cake, went smooth as silk just took the one and of course the first one was a little rocky and we talked about that and we figured what did I do right what did I do wrong what could we have both done differently hangar fluid on the next leg as we we're on to our destination to figure out how to do it better and that worked well that was a big help to us all those test pilots clocks they were already wound pretty tight weren't they? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I've thought that ever since I read the book it's like really because First thing when we got on those airplanes, T-28, right? One part of the pre-flight, wind the clock up, make sure it's, yeah, but that's what they always said they did. I don't know. I'm just curious, U.S. pilots are so well trained in the military, but what are your thoughts on how well the Soviet or North Korean or Chinese pilots are trained? And are they more apt to make a mistake and they screw up and they can uh, rush them out of control? And it's not so much, right, it's the individual pilot that well, um, that's, an, that's a very good question. The, a lot of that has to do with money, because without money, you can't afford to fly the airplanes to train people. So some of these states, North Korea, doesn't have a lot of disposable income. They have problems with getting people trained. So that's a concern. Uh, another problem that comes up occasionally is trust. The Soviet Union was notorious for not trusting their pilots. They generally controlled the aircraft from the ground, and the pilot was there in case of an emergency or the data link was lost. So, and this was a function of a MiG-25 was stolen by a Soviet pilot flown to Japan and taken apart by the US and the Japanese and so forth, and the pilot was debriefed and given asylum, but that was one of the things they learned is that they aren't really trusted because they're afraid they will do what that one individual did and so they didn't have the control sometimes to do things. Now, with that in mind, when I flew those missions for two and a half years, we saw Soviet fighters on all but one occasion. And the one occasion we did not see them, there were embedded thunderstorms everywhere. We were just getting beat up all day. There was no purpose in being out there because it was just rotten weather all the way down to the deck. So their Navy was doing nothing either. But every other day we were flying, we saw one, two, up. The most we saw on a given mission was 15, because they were doing a lot of training that day, the Soviets were. Normally you'd see three to five fighters a day. So they were out there all the time. So when you see these articles in the paper about Soviet bear aircraft off our shores these days, and they're trying to make a, uh, trying to turn it into a big deal, fact of the matter is that's been going on forever, and we've been doing it to them forever, because that's how everybody keeps an eye on each other. Good, bad, and different again, well, everyone decides for themselves, but it's not an unusual situation that they're out there. And the, I was not on the mission I'm about to mention here. Um, 
when they would show up, they'd take pictures of us. When they would show up, we would take pictures of them and we'd send it to analysts, always looking to see if some little thing might have changed. Is there an extra hole on the aircraft? What might that be? Are they adding in new systems?